This segment focuses on understanding the regioselectivity of elimination reactions using what's referred to as Zaitsev's rule. So I know that there's a bunch of terminology here in the title. By the end of this segment, you should understand what each of these terms mean and how to apply those terms toward problems. So first off, a reminder that the term regioselectivity refers to a reaction where there are multiple constitutional isomer products that hypothetically could be formed by the reaction, but in actuality, only some of those or one of those is preferred over the other. So in other words, the reaction is selecting or it's choosing a preferred constitutional isomer product out of the reaction. That's what we mean when we say the reaction is regioselective, is it's making a selection about what product will form. So for example, if we take a look at this elimination reaction down here at the bottom, we see that if we take a look at our alpha position, or the alpha position is the position where the leaving group is bonded and the leaving group is going to break away. And then we look at the beta positions, remember that the elimination reaction could also be referred to as a beta elimination because we're removing a proton from the beta position. And here, removing a proton from the beta position right here, which would be this proton, would lead to the product that we see on the left. It would lead to this product if we remove the proton right here. On the other hand, if we remove one of the two protons up here at this beta position, we would end up with the product that we see on the right-hand side. The reaction does indeed make a choice here or a selection, hence we would refer to this reaction as being regioselective. And the spoiler alert here is that the product of this reaction is primarily going to correspond to the structure on the left. So we wish to understand in this segment how we go about predicting that the structure on the left is going to be the preferred structure and why is it going to be the preferred structure. So let's take a look at, in fact, this exact problem here. We're going to go through the mechanism for it to reinforce the E2 reaction mechanism. And we're going to develop our understanding of Zaitsev's rule, which is the rule we use to predict that the alkene constitutional isomer that we prefer is the one on the left here and not the one on the right. So why in the world did we pick that structure on the left rather than picking the structure on the right? So let's go through the mechanism for this particular reaction. So the mechanism for this reaction, remember we're doing an E2, that's what our clue says there with the reaction arrow, it says to do an E2 reaction mechanism, not a substitution reaction or anything else. So we're gonna go ahead and start off here and I'm gonna fill in all of the hydrogen atoms around our reaction site because that's a good idea in helping keep track of where all the atoms are at. And remember that that's a methyl group at the end of the line there. It's a really common mistake people make at this stage to assume that there's a hydrogen there or something like that. Nope, it's a methyl group because that's the end of the line. So we filled in all of our hydrogens and showing them explicitly around our reaction site. And now to decide what we're going to use as the base here in this elimination reaction. Keep in mind that there's a large electronegativity difference between a sodium and a nitrogen. What this molecule is actually going to be is Na plus NH2 minus. And the nitrogen there would have to have two sets of lone pair electrons. And it is going to be a very strong base, in fact. And so what's going to happen in order to lead to that product that we've put stars on up top, the base is going to use its lone pair of electrons to attack the proton right here. That's at our beta position. In other words, it's bonded to our beta carbon right there. And as a consequence of that, at the same time, the carbon hydrogen bond is to break. Those electrons have to go somewhere. They come over to make a carbon carbon double bond. And this is enabled because of the fact that we can break away that leaving group there. So we don't have to go over the octet at that carbon by forming a carbon-carbon double bond. So our product here, matching up with what we've drawn up top there, carbon-carbon double bond, methyl group bonded right here. We would also, as a result of this reaction, create inorganic products of chloride anion. Pretty stable product there as well as NH3. So we took our NH2 
We picked up another proton from our organic molecules, so it will become NH3. It still has to have one set of lone pair electrons because we had one set of lone pair electrons here that we didn't do anything with. So those are gonna still be present in our final product. So why did we choose to create the product that we did? The reason is that that is the more substituted product. And the more substituted product is the more stable product. And Zaitsev's rule is the rule that describes this observation and phenomenon. So Zaitsev's rule is a rule for predicting the products of elimination reactions. And it's a rule that really describes the stability of different alkenes. So Zaitsev's rule says that the regioselectivity of reactions, in other words, what constitutional isomer is preferred by reactions, can be predicted by looking for the most substituted product that corresponds to removal of a beta proton. So Zaitsev's rule predicts that formation of a more substituted, and specifically say more alkyl substituted, alkene is favored. And the reason it's favored is because that more substituted alkene is lower in energy. It is more stable. So to make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we say that it's more substituted, we can come up to the top here and look at these two different possible products that we've outlined in green. And if we looked at the structure on the left and we ask how many alkyl substituents are bonded to the alkene. So we focus on the alkene group here. And we ask how many alkyl groups, or in other words, how many alkyl branches come off of that alkene group. So there's one right here because there's a methyl group, two right here going around the ring in that direction, and then three coming to here. So there's three alkyl substituents on our alkene group on the left. On the other hand, if we come to the alkene group on the right, so here's our alkene group, and we look at alkyl substituents coming off, there's one here and one here. We count just that directly bonded carbon atom as our alkyl substituent. So there's just two alkyl substituents if we look at the structure on the right. So only two alkyl substituents on the carbon-carbon double bond here, and so therefore, the structure on the left has more alkyl substituents, hence it is the preferred product by following Zaitsev's rule. And Zaitsev's rule is a really important rule driven by the stability of alkenes, and it will allow us to predict reliably what constitutional isomer product is preferred by these elimination reactions. So we definitely want to be comfortable with the application of Zaitsev's rule. So let's apply that toward one additional example problem here to make sure that we have the handle on how to apply Zaitsev's rule toward these E2 reaction mechanisms. And by the way, we will also be applying Zaitsev's rule to the E1 reactions as well. So you're not done with Zaitsev's rule yet. You're gonna see it again. So we'll take a look at this elimination reaction example. And what I want you to do here is predict the product of the reaction as well as provide a mechanism for that. And typically when we say predict the product, what we're referring to is predict the major organic product. So we're going to try to pick the major organic product and provide a mechanism to show how that product would form. So I suggest you hit the pause button, try to go through this, make sure that you have a handle on it, and then hit play in order to see how correct you were all right, so let's take a look at the solution to this reaction problem. So we're asked to provide the mechanism and the major product of the reaction. So what I'm going to do to show the mechanism is just redraw the structure, including all the hydrogens at both the alpha position and the beta position of this molecule. So as a reminder, the alpha position we refer to as the carbon atom that has the leaving group bonded to it, and the beta position is what's next door. And it's gonna be particularly those protons at the beta position that we're really interested in. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug those all in explicitly. So here at this end, we have a CH3 group. So I'm just gonna put my three hydrogens directly bonded to that carbon there. And then we come to this beta position. 
and we would have just one lonely proton bonded there to fill the octet on that carbon. We do the E2 reaction with KOH. So with KOH, the way that we can think of that is definitely that the potassium ion there is just a spectator. There's a large electronegativity difference between potassium and oxygen, so therefore oxygen is our anion. Our oxygen anion is going to act as our base, and it's going to come in and attack at either the position right here, or alternatively, it can attack at the other beta position and grab a proton right here. So what we need to decide then is which is going to be more favorable. If we grab a proton from this carbon on the left, the double bond is gonna end up going right here as the leaving group leaves. And that would give us a product that had only one alkyl substituent bonded to the carbon-carbon double bond. On the other hand, if instead we were to take the lone pair of electrons and bring them over to here, carbon-carbon double bond is going to end up forming right here as the leaving group leaves. And that's going to give us a product that has two alkyl substituents. Two alkyl substituents, certainly better than one by Zaitsev's rule. And so this is the route we're going to take. So full mechanism here, the oxygen lone pair electrons come over, grab a proton from the acid, or in other words, from our organic molecule, carbon hydrogen bond breaks, those electrons come over to make a carbon carbon double bond at the same time the leaving group leaves. That's the hallmark of the E2 reaction. Remember is that everything's happening at once. Okay, so we'll go ahead and write the product out of this reaction. So our product of this reaction is going to be water. Water we would classify as our conjugate acid because our base grabbed a proton to become that product. Therefore, it fits the definition of conjugate acid. And I'll go ahead and fill in the rest here. So filling in my organic molecule and my carbon-carbon double bond. I'm going to put in blue here for emphasis to give this. And we would also make out of that reaction bromide anion. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that in as Br minus to finish off this reaction. And keep in mind here that our product we would describe as having two alkyl substitutions on the alkene group. One here, one here, and one here. So it actually ends up being three alkyl substitutions. My bad there. So there's three alkyl substitutions here, here, and here on this particular product. And that is certainly more than if we would put the carbon-carbon double bond over here. So therefore, we've chosen to put it where we did to follow Zaitsev's rule to make the most alkyl substituted product that we possibly can.